and uh, welcome, whether you're joining us online via Zoom this morning. Lord, we acknowledge that we meet in challenging times. But Lord, we give thanks that we can come together, uh, no matter how we're participating this morning. And Lord, it is our prayer today as we celebrate the fourth Sunday in Advent, that we might experience and know something of your love and your peace this morning. Lord, would you just be with us, minister your love and grace to us, and may we celebrate your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So before we start this morning, I um, thought I'd share with you all that we received a, a Christmas card uh, sent to us all from uh, Pete and Sue, uh, who used to minister here at uh, Queensbury. So I'll just read the message that uh, was in the card that they sent to us. Hi all, a bizarre year for us all, but hope you are well. We are looking forward to visiting Nottingham once again when we are free to travel. As you heard, we lost mum to COVID. She was 99 years old, but we were able to nurse her at her home for the last month of her life. So we're able to stay and say our goodbyes. Lots of love and God's leading and blessing be upon you all, Pete and Sue. And so it's good to hear from our friends uh, over in the Wirral. And um, of course, we, we send our love, our peace and the blessings of Christmas back to them. And as we start this morning, uh, we're going to start with a uh, Christmas carol. And so the worship are going to lead us as we sing together at home. Sadly, uh, not in church, um, the Calypso carol. Thank you.
So as we celebrate the, the fourth Sunday in Advent, today we'll light the, the fourth candle in our Advent crown. And this is where I could do with James being at the side of me because he'd be saying, Dad, it's, it's not hope, it's peace, it's not joy, it's love. Um, he'd be able to tell me which order to light them in. So uh, let's hope I get this right. So we'll light our, our first candle, which we celebrated as the candle of hope. And our second candle, the candle of peace, the candle of joy, and finally today, the candle signifying Jesus' love for us. And then on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, we'll light the center candle, candle signifying Christ. Unfortunately, we won't be doing that here in church this year. And so what I'd like you to encourage you to do is if you have your own Advent crown at home, then light that center candle as a family and come together and celebrate and pray as you light that candle. And uh, if you don't have your own Advent crown, then it doesn't need to be a crown. It could just be one single candle that you come together on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day to light and to acknowledge the coming of our Saviour Jesus. And so in response to the love that we know that is on offer, our worship team are going to lead us in song and praise as we sing Jesus, lover of my soul.
Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks. We give thanks for Advent. We give thanks that we have a time to prepare for the coming of our King. Lord, as we approach Christmas, we ask for forgiveness if we've lost our way. We ask for forgiveness if perhaps our Christmas has been overtaken by the giving of gifts, socialising with family and friends, overindulging in earthly delights. Lord, we pray that this Christmas we might once again return to the very foundations, the very truth of what Christmas is and what it signifies. Lord, as we journey through unknown and challenging times, let us turn to you. Lord, as we look at our nation, we see people in fear. We see an, an economy shattered. We see panic and confusion. And we see hurt, pain and suffering. Lord, as our nation is brought to its knees in the face of this pandemic, may we personally also be brought to our knees. Because when we are there, when we are on our knees, recognising our weakness, accepting our vulnerability, we also realise it's the perfect place to be for the time we find ourselves in. And so, Lord, as we kneel before you, as we complete our journey through the advent of 2020, we call out in your name. We accept that alone we are powerless. Powerless but for the truth, the glory, the miracle of Christmas. Lord, we pray, as we've heard the lessons of this Advent season, that we all, as a nation, both those who believe and those who are yet to believe, will accept the love and salvation of Christ, our Emmanuel, whose birth we will celebrate, come rain or storm, on Christmas Day. Lord, whilst we may not be able to come together as we might normally do, whilst we may be apart from those we cherish and love so dearly, may we all come together, joined by the Holy Spirit, as we light that final candle in Advent, the candle that signifies the arrival of Christ, May we all come together as one in prayer of thanksgiving for all that you have given us and all that we have. And may we all come together as one in a prayer of hope for the future. In Jesus' name, amen. As you've picked up your morning paper this morning, or as you've turned on the news, 
We read devastating headlines of Christmas being cancelled. Let me tell you this morning, Christmas is not cancelled. Maybe as a nation, we've forgotten or we've pushed aside the true meaning of Christmas. And as a body of believers, you know, we got a choice. We can get caught up in that storm of attention grabbing headlines. Headlines which cast doom and gloom. Headlines which depress, cast darkness and incite fear. And although we recognize there are those that are struggling in these dark times. There are those who are very lonely. We say to them, you are not alone. This Christmas, no, you are not alone. As believers, we can choose to offer a different perspective. We can choose to share the hope that is on offer. We can choose to share the peace our Saviour brings. We can choose to share the joy of the Christmas story. And we can share to the love of Christ that is poured out for each and every one of us. We can choose to be the light of that advent crown that we lit earlier. We can choose light over darkness. We do not face this journey alone. So let us all come together right now as one to bow and confess, Jesus, our Lord, our King, our Saviour.
before we continue just take a moment to sit in the silence and to come before our Lord Jesus Lord, we pray that this Christmas, many more will come. Lord, may you bless all those that gather and meet in your name this season. May the truth of the gospel reach far and wide. Amen. And so we're going to be joined this morning by Pete. Unfortunately, Pete couldn't be with us in person uh, due to the restrictions. But um, in many ways, we're also blessed that Pete can't physically be with us. Because as we're learning, one of the advantages of not being at church opens up other possibilities in the way that we can deliver the message. And so I'm going to leave the tape to play and uh, we'll see what Pete has to share with us this morning. Thank you. Hello, my QBC friends. It's Christmas! Well, nearly, it's Advent. And I have the great privilege this morning of talking to you about love as the Advent theme. Now, if you're looking for the story of Christmas in the Bible, then you're going to go to one or two places. You're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew, where Matthew spends um, a lot of the time of the birth narrative establishing that Jesus is the one that everyone's been waiting for. He starts with the genealogy, and then he looks at all the, the prophecies that are fulfilled through Jesus' birth. He looks at um, Joseph and the effects on him. The, the other place you'll look is the Gospel of Luke, um, based mainly, mainly on Mary's recollections and her thoughts and seen through her eyes. Uh, it starts with um, Elizabeth and Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist. And it begins to establish the main central themes of Luke's gospel, which is, who is Jesus? Who is he? Why did he come? What is his purpose? But there is another place to look for the Christmas story in the gospel. 
And this one starts much further back. It takes the view from much higher up. And rather than look at the impact on the characters in the Christmas story itself, I think that's where you find the, the main message of what God's love is about in the Christmas story for you. And that's in the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at a few verses of that today. So before we hit that Gospel, let's, let's pray. Let's pray that as we explore this theme of love in this season of Advent, where our hearts are yearning and shouting, Come, Lord Jesus, that we might see afresh and anew that that cry from our hearts and the hearts of all humanity was heard centuries ago. And God is as keen for us to know his love, his personal love, yet his cosmic love, as much today as he was then. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. I wonder if you've ever seen the program Back to the Shop Floor. You've, you've probably heard of it, even if you haven't seen it. Uh, but basically what happens is one of the, the very top bosses of a company goes down anonymously and takes on the job of one of the lowest paid, lowest status workers. And they work on the shop floor for a period of time and they, um, they, they hear all the tales about this mismanagement of the anonymous them upstairs. Um, and they get to see the conditions that um, most workers have to deal with every day. Uh, and equally, the, um, the, the people in the normal job get to know this person who they think has just joined the company as one of them. And then at the end of the week, there's always the grand reveal where everyone's called into a room and the identity of this secret new worker is revealed. And they realize that um, this anonymous them is actually a person with a character who, who feels and does actually care. And equally, the, the person at the top gets a better understanding of what it's like to be the, the people who have to work right in the front line. And there's always uh, an, ine an inevitable shift in the relationships afterwards with mutual understanding, mutual respect, and some changes for the, for the good of the company as a whole, but for the good of the person who work there. Now, it's, it's a very um, insufficient analogy for Christmas because, of course, God knows us inside out. He doesn't have to learn anything about us. But there's a, an element of cosmic back to the shop floor about what happens at Christmas. We're told that Jesus, who created the universe, who was the word that spoke life into being, came and lived here, lived with us. He brought with him the glory and the grace and the truth from the Father, but equally, people saw him. He was held as a baby. They played with him. They laughed with him. They hung out with him. They probably got annoyed with him. They joked with him. They cried with him. And equally, we read in the Gospels that Jesus was astonished. He was surprised. He was excited. He was entertained. He was saddened. He was disappointed in some of the things that he encountered because he came to live with us, our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, if I'm gonna talk about love as an Advent theme, then there's only one place I can start, and that is with Jesus. 40 years ago, I know, I don't look old enough, but about 40 years ago, I said to Jesus that I would take him at his word, that I believed he loved me so much that he was willing to go through life and then die for me so that I could know God's love for myself in this life and the next. And as I look back over those 40 years, as many of you can look back over years gone by, I've blown it many times and I've had to deal with the sadnesses of life just like everybody else does. But I have seen God's love as a constant companion through it all. But Jesus dying and rising again to save us, well, that's the Easter story, right? And as I've already shouted quite loudly in a public place, it is Christmas. Well, that's true, but one only makes sense because of the other. Easter was only possible because of God's decision to rescue the world from itself and the decisions it had made. 
And Christmas is only as important as it is because that's the moment, that's the point at which God looked at the problems of the world, just as he looks at the problems within me now. And he says, enough. The world needs me. The world needs to know me. Everybody, everybody, without exception. And that everybody includes you. So that's the story of Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And it's the message of every Christmas that God wants us to know him. And he wants to be known by us too. He will not remain distant. He will not remain remote. He will not remain like Father Christmas, somewhere up in a location who pops out every now and then. His core of love compels him to be known better than that. And he loves us better than that. So if you're watching this from your home, I want you to look around your lounge right now or whichever room you're in. Um, if you're in a little box room, then picture your lounge. And likewise, if you're not at home, picture your living room. My guess is that as you cast your eye or your mind's eye around that room, it's full of mementos of precious times and precious people. I'd imagine there's photos of loved ones. There's, there's gifts that you've been given at significant moments. There's things that you've brought from your own timeline and you've treasured because they're special to you and they're important to you and they remind you of people who are special to you and who, who have treasured you. Well, I also guess that right now there's some Christmas stuff in that room. There might be Christmas cards, maybe a tree, maybe decorations. I want you to look at each one of those Christmassy things as a token of God's love for you. It's as personal to you as all those other things. You are as special to him as all those people in the photos are to you. So this Christmas, can you just take a moment and have a look at that stuff? And imagine that every single one of those has been sent to you with love. How does that make you feel about that love? And how could you respond? So these verses from John make it very clear that God does want to be known. And that's the ultimate act of love. Indifference is the opposite of love, not always hate. If God was indifferent to us, if he was remote and stayed far away and made no effort to bridge the gap between us, then that would be the opposite of love. And so he does the opposite. I wonder if sometimes like you, you can fall into the trap as, as I do sometimes, I believe that God is a, a bigger, magnified, cosmic version of me. So when the world is not going as I want it to, when God isn't behaving himself, as I can see it sometimes, and doing what I would want him to know, I, I treat him as if it's one of my human friends that's got it wrong. Uh, what's, what's wrong with you? Where are you? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you with me in this? And I, I can think that God is having some kind of tantrum or he's withdrawn himself from me to, to teach me a lesson or to, um, to, to get himself together. I, I impose on him the same needy reactions to life that I can have, as if he is just a cosmic version of my own emotionally needy responses to life. But this, of course, is, is nonsense. We're, we're told endlessly in Scripture that God is, is not this. He's not like us in that way. We might be made in his image in the sense of our, our spirit and our soul and our ability to relate to him. But his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are high and above. He is the absolute core, the center of mercy and truth and love. I don't know about you, but that's, that's not me. He doesn't want to remain distant and detached. He wants to be known, which is what Christmas is all about. But it's nothing new. Think of the story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve blew it completely and everything went wrong, 
that the first thing God did was look for them. He came to them. He shouted, Adam, where are you? But not because he had lost Adam. He's God. He knew where Adam was. He was asking Adam, where are you? Do you know? Do you know that you've gone away from me? Do you know that you're now separated from me? Adam, where are you? And Adam responded with words of, of both um, deceit and blame, but also shame and nakedness. And from that moment through to Christmas, through to us today, God has been seeking to be made known again. And the ultimate expression of that was when Jesus himself was born. God in human form, when he, he walked among us, when humans were able to hear his words of love, to speak to him, to see what a loving life really looked like. And because of the life he lived and the death he died, it's possible for us to know God again and be known by him. And one of the ways Jesus made that clear is he described himself as the light of the world, something that could be seen in darkness. And the reason that that's really important is because he then went on to call us, his followers, lights of the world, because it says others look at us, that they can then see Jesus in our lives, in our words, not because of who we are, but because if you spend enough time in a close relationship with the Father, it begins to rub off. If you spend enough time in the light, then you begin to shine. So as soon as Jesus was born, the heavens couldn't help themselves from shouting the good news out. A star lit up the sky so bright that it started journeys from foreign lands to travel to find him. The shepherds minding their own business, who were suddenly scared witless by a choir of heavenly angels telling them to not be afraid because there was good news. God was making himself and his love known. And this Christmas is no different. There's a lot of talk about the role of the shepherds in the Christmas story, particularly as to why they were the first to be told. Uh, there's plenty of very good explanations. Uh, they were the storytellers of their day. They were the way that messages were spread from one village to another. They were the common, the everyday poor folk. They were the symbol of Jesus as the shepherd uh, or of David, the shepherd here in David's town. Uh, and all of these, I'm sure, are layers of meaning in this and there will be many, many more. But let me ask you a different question. Why not the shepherds? Who should have been told first? Was there a protocol that God should have been following as he told his world of his love and how much he loved them? Should there be a, a hierarchy in which he announced who he loved the most and, and a rank order of those that should be told in order for it to be proper? Is that what God should have done? But perhaps we sometimes have a hierarchy of who we think God should be loving and how he should be doing it. But God is like The whole point of Jesus coming at Christmas was that hierarchies were, were ruled out. As, as Mary said in her song of joy, um, the, the rich and the powerful, he sent empty away, but he's filled the hungry with good things. So why not the shepherd? Why shouldn't they be first? And I ask you, if why not the shepherd, then why not you? Do you think God should be loving other people, telling other people of his love this Christmas? Well, the message of the nativity is that he wants to tell you that he loves you that he wants to announce his good news to you are you putting other people before that or can you come to the front of the line and say yes god i need your love too i believe that you love me please please sing your good news to me and i will find you and i will worship I've no doubt this year, perhaps more than many other Christmases before, there are many of you who, like Mary and Joseph, are feeling uncertain about the future, or feeling lonely, or desperate, or confused. 
But just as 2,000 years ago, the shepherds and the Magi got to see God's love face to face, just as many of us have over many Christmases past, the opportunity to know his love is still there for anyone that looks for him as the shepherds did or explores and asks questions as the Magi did. So can I invite you to do something this Christmas? Whether you've known God's love personally in a deep way for decades or whether you're not even sure if God exists, then the challenge is exactly the same. My guess is somewhere around your house at the moment, there is a candle. So I just say to you, in the days between now and Christmas Day, find a place of quiet and five minutes, just five minutes. Get the candle, sit down and light it. And as you look at the flame, just say in the words that you're comfortable with, God, show me how much you love me. Just that. God, show me how much you love me. Just five minutes each day. Let the time go. Let it pass as it will. Let your words and your thoughts fall. See where it takes you. You've got nothing to lose. But maybe you've got everything to gain. If, like the Magi, it leaves you with questions and a desire to explore, then get in touch with us at QBC. We'd be happy to partner with you as you explore and make your journey. If, like the shepherds, you just want to get close to Jesus, then again, get in touch, because that's what we're all about. But whatever, this Christmas, I pray that even if you've seen them countless times before, this Christmas may be one where you see the wonders of God's love and have a deep knowledge of his desire to be known by you and for you to know him like never before. Thanks for your time. Very Merry Christmas. Hello, my QBC friends. It's Christmas! So thank you, Pete, for uh, sending that and, and sharing that, that with us today. And I think it's only right that uh, we now take time to respond uh, to that message. And so we're going to put some words upon the screen. I'm going to read the bits in white. And if you'd all like to join in uh, with the text that appears in yellow. Let the love that shaped earth and heaven dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that created humanity dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that overcomes suffering and hatred dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that causes us to rejoice with loved ones dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that forgives and renews dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that brings reconciliation after separation dwell within us this Christmas. Let the love that brings the blessing of peace dwell within us this Christmas. And may we share that peace with all people near and far. Amen. And so we're going to sing our final carol for this morning. Angels from the realm of glory. And then I do hope that uh, you'll join QBC later this afternoon online on our YouTube channel at 5 p.m. where we will be premiering our carol service and invitations will be going out for that uh, via email after this morning service. Thank you. i yeah. 
People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in deepest night are lit up with a brilliant sight. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The spread of his influence and of his peace will never end. Therefore, go out into the world with great joy. And the grace of Bethlehem's matchless child the love of the God who never ceases to amaze and the fellowship of the Spirit who never wearies will be with you all this holy night and evermore. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so all that remains is for me to wish you a very Merry Christmas and may you all be blessed in this time when we celebrate the birth of our Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>